Hello everyone. Uh, I think I'm probably about two minutes early here. Just kind of give people time to maybe get on. And <clears throat> um, before I start in this morning, I might say, you know, I, well, first I want to welcome everyone. Um, everyone from uh, First Gospel Church. I miss all of you. I miss having church with you. I wish at least I could see you. <laughs> they got to fix this thing where you can not only see me, but I can see y'all. But I guess that's down the road maybe. But anyway, uh, uh, before I start anything this morning, I, I thought I might say something about um, repercussions of sin. I recently was talking to someone dealing with a situation you know, uh, about a person's sins and uh, this person just kept saying, why can't we have love? Why can't we have forgiveness? And, and you know, once a person repents, um, we should forgive them and that should be the end of it. And I said, well, it is true with some sins, but some sins, that's not true. Um, See, depends, it depends on the, um, the category or the depth of sin that, you ha that, that God has to deal with. I, I, I use this uh, uh, hypothesis. I said if someone murders someone, they could be forgiven for, you know, if they could hit enough humility and have true repentance with godly sorrow, they could get forgiveness from God but that doesn't mean that they might have to spend the rest of their life in prison. They would have to pay. You, you're, you reap what you sow, and sometimes sins are not severe enough that uh, some they can just be forgiven. But some sins, if um, if they're if sins are created, uh, are not created, but but uh, uh, committed in such a way that it it. It affects God's work. If it affects, uh, for an example, if it affects a minister, can send to a point that his ministry has been hurt to a point that people can no longer have confidence in him. Um, uh, he may not be able to just get forgiveness and go right on. He may have to hit a place of humility and it may depend upon God whether or not God can work with him and reestablish him again to where he would have influence and people would have confidence in him. Uh, you, you also can sin against the body of Christ in a way that no one has confidence in you. And if you've been in a place of leadership, it wouldn't make any difference if you was a pastor's wife or a pastor or a minister uh, or a leader in an, in an assembly, if you commit sins deep enough that it causes people to lose confidence in you, then uh, you can be forgiven, but it doesn't mean that everything can be done away with. The repercussions of some sins is severe enough that it, it will take time to restore if restoration actually can take place. Anyway, I just thought I'd say something about that while uh, people were getting on and, um, and uh, you know, uh, our church for the most part, you know, uh, will get on and, and listen this morning. It's the only way I have to communicate with you guys. I hope everyone is doing okay. I've talked to some of you on the phone. Um, I'm praying for you all and and uh, hopefully, I'm hopeful that God will uh, soon help our our government and our medical professionals that will they'll be able to find uh, an avenue of of uh, better way of dealing with this coronavirus situation, and that this social distancing uh, can end. Um, I'm. 
you know, I do think that it's there is wisdom in it. Obviously, if you're not around a lot of people, you're not going to be nearly as apt to be uh, subject to coming in contact with, with the disease. Anyway, I think we're all pretty well aware of that today. Um, anyway, I hope everyone's spirits are up. I, I mentioned in our last video that... Um, you know, what, what's taking place right now in the world is not to take your focus away from God. God is not in this for his people. Uh, you know, I'm sure anything this worldwide and this severe, uh, no question that God's aware of it, but whatever, however God's gonna use it, or even if God, uh, this is part of, what God is doing to shape the world in uh, in judgment. God is going to judge this world in the end of the Gentile world, and so you you would be foolish not to realize that the like I mentioned the other day, <clears throat> God's uh, the 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 heart of a king is in the hand of the Lord. The Bible says. It also says that he sets up kings and tears them down. And so God's controlling this world and, and who is over every nation, who's a ruler over people. And so the Lord is, is uh, you know, this thing will shape up to perform the, the will of God and to finish God's purpose in the Gentile world. <clears throat> I mentioned, uh, I may just, go ahead and say some things about this. I mentioned about how that uh, God prepared Abraham and and brought up his descendants. And uh, <clears throat> it actually took a 2,000 year period for God to develop the Israelites, the Jewish world. He came in the end of that world and harvested that world and made up a portion of his bride and of course established a new covenant uh, that uh, brought life, brought life back. There was no life before Jesus came to this world. After Adam sinned and fell, there was not a man that had the life of God uh, or God's nature. Uh, we just had Adam. We just had the life of Adam and it was a temporal life. It was cursed. Um, the 23rd Psalms, you know, is about Jesus. When it said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Jesus was overshadowed by death. Death overshadowed every man uh, until Jesus came. He said, I come to give you life and to give it to you more abundantly. Well, that life Jesus came to give was a newborn, the newborn life. To be born again, like Jesus told Nicodemus, to be born of God's nature, just like Jesus. Uh, he, was, he was of God's nature, even though he was in Mary's womb, he was of God's nature. God was his father, Joseph was not. Uh, Mary was his mother and she gave, she, you know, housed the egg that Jesus was reduced uh, to a seed and placed in Mary's womb. And so when he was born, he was born human, but he was born a human that was also born of God. And so uh, he had a part of God. He was, he was, uh, had the nature of God, but he also was made up of the Adamic nature because he was a human. He became a human. Uh, that tells us that in the in in Hebrews. Let's turn to the book of Hebrews in the second chapter, um, and uh, and read it there. Um. Uh, let's see. Okay, in the second chapter of Hebrews, 
It says, um, Jesus, in the ninth verse, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. See, he no longer was divine. He no longer had, uh, had a divine uh, body. He wasn't celestial. He was terrestrial. He had an earthly body. He, he became a human um, let's, let's read a little bit further. Um, verse 12 says, saying, I will declare, this is, uh, quoting Psalms 22, where it says, saying, I will declare thy name, Jesus. This is a prophecy of Jesus saying, I'll declare thy name, God's name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Will I sing praise unto thee, unto thee, God, the father. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage for verily he took not on him the nature of angels but he took on him the seed of Abraham wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he's able to secure them that are tempted. So as I was saying, Jesus, he took on the, he took, he became a human, but he was of God. He was also born of the nature of God. When Jesus came to this world, uh, he came to give us life. That's what he said. And to give it more, more abundantly. When he came to give us life, that was the rebirth, the birth of the spirit of God, to be born of God's nature. And that takes a, a born again experience of the Holy Ghost, to be born again. And then uh, to have it more abundantly would finally be to finish your course and reap eternal life. Uh, you can be born of God, born of God's nature, but if you don't overcome the Adamic nature, you, once, once you're born again, let me say this, before you're born again, you're just born of Adam. And you're of a corrupt nature. You're all, you're, uh, all your lifetime, you're in bondage. You're under the, the overshadowing of death. Death is the curse that was put on Adam and all of his descendants. Um, and, and now you may be saying, well, Brother Smith, if Jesus came and there was no life before Christ, uh, what happened to all the people in the Old Testament? Well, it, it, it would take a resurrection. It takes the resurrection of the dead for those people to receive this life. That's why Jesus came uh, and uh, it would take, it would take uh, it, it takes the resurrection for those Old Testament worthies to resurrect and receive the born again experience and finish. But just remember this, Adam was, it was, he was imputed righteousness because of his faith and death didn't, you know, uh, the Bible says precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints those Old Testament worthies that were faithful to God, they, they had a promise. They had a hope. Uh, even Job, the oldest book in the Bible, he said, he said uh, you know, concerning uh, uh, death, he said uh, that though the skin worms eat my flesh, Yet in my flesh, I'll see God. He, you see, in his flesh, it would take a resurrection in the flesh. A lot of people think that when the resurrection is only for 
to gain eternal life, but the Bible doesn't teach that that way. Uh, there were several people that died in the Bible that were raised from the dead. And then if you read Matthew 27, the 27th chapter in the 52nd verse, it says after, after Jesus' resurrection, many of the saints which slept arose uh, from the graves and went into the city and were seen of many. That's just a, that's just a little sentence in the Bible. And uh, a lot of people pass that over. They don't realize, you know, this was this. There's talking about people here that resurrected from the dead, went into the city, and they were seen of many people. And uh, so, after Jesus's resurrection, uh, together with my dead body, uh, Isaiah said, "Shall they arise?" Somebody give me that scripture in Isaiah. Put it up uh, in a comment for me there. Look it up, one of you brothers, while I'm. Uh, talking here. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, you know, a lot of people have a lot of ideas. That's called ideology. Ideas is not the truth of the word of God. We, we, have, to, we have to line up with the scriptures of God's word to understand God's word. Anyway, Jesus came in this world to give you and I life and to give it more abundantly. You and I are a blessed people that if you're born again of God's spirit, and that is to be born of his nature. Uh, Isaiah 26, 19, Sister Lila, uh, Lila put it on there for me. Let's turn to it. Isaiah um, 26. Thank you, Sister Lila. Okay. <clears throat> All right, here it says, <clears throat> thy dead men, Isaiah 26, verse 19, thy dead men shall live together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for the dew, thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be passed, be overpassed. For, who, for behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Um, so here, this is talking about a resurrection. Together with my dead body shall they arise. This is talking about the people of God and this is in the old covenant. Under the old covenant, these are the people back there that would resurrect. And I gave you the scripture in Matthew 27, 52, where the graves were opened after his resurrection and many of the saints which slept arose and went into the city and were seen of many. That was a resurrection that took place. And no doubt it was the Old Testament worthies that resurrected and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost which is the nature of God through the new birth, being born of God's spirit and having that nature. See, to, to, develop, the, to, de, to develop this uh, spiritual life, to develop the overcoming life, it's going to take... <clears throat> Uh, not you. There's no way you can you can uh, change the Adamic nature. That's a fallen nature, and that's why you've got to be born again of God's nature. 
uh, Adam was born of God in the garden. And if Adam would have developed, you know, he was born, uh, but he was also born of God. Consider this. God is not going to force you or I to be saved. He's not going to force you and I to be a part of his eternal kingdom. He gives us a choice. And God, that is an absolute must of God because God, he doesn't want anyone because he made them to have to be righteous. That's like making robots or, you know, like, like make, God wouldn't get any pleasure out of that, but what God gets pleasure out of is seeing people who uh, develop and love righteousness. Look what he said to Jesus in Hebrews, the first chapter, quoting uh, the Old Testament scripture there where he said, because thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Now, what iniquity is, is doing your own will. It's, it's doing whatever you want to do. But how... Uh, uh, because he said to Jesus, because you love righteousness and hate iniquity, therefore God, <clears throat> even thy God has given you joy above your fellows. See, when God works in your life uh, and, and, and you begin to work with God, you know, when you, when you really begin, God gets a hold of you. First off, let's, let's, uh, let's just say this, that you never have, you didn't find God. He found you. You were lost. You had no way of knowing how to find God. Jesus said this, no man cometh unto me except my father draws him. God has to have a way to draw his people. And so, and, and the way God does that God can, he can talk to anybody at any time, anywhere. And God has done that at, at, at times. Uh, that's, that's rare because that's not the normal of how God works because it's, it won't as accomplish as much as God working, for example, if God's working in my life, and my life influences those who are I'm around. Just like my mother. My mother was a Holy Ghost woman. She was, a, she was born of the Holy Ghost when she was just a girl, just a teenage girl. And uh, God got a hold of her and she served God all of her life. I don't think mother ever got out of church after that. Not to my knowledge. But, and then she raised us boys. Now, my dad, my dad was a, a godly man too, but he didn't have the Holy Ghost when he and mother married. You know, there, that was part of a lack of understanding uh, where it's not wise at all for a, a, a spirit born again person to marry someone that's not born again. That, that's not, <clears throat> that's really not biblical but they didn't have the knowledge of that back there. That wasn't taught back when they got married, at least in not, not in the realm of where they were in, in God, in church. The church they were in didn't teach that way. Anyway, so my dad had more trouble than my mother did, but my mother was steadfast in serving God. And she raised us boys, and dad had enough fear of God that he would... Uh, he would make us boys go to church with mama if he didn't go. There was times that he was faithful to go to church and then there was times that he'd fall away and, and wouldn't be faithful, but, but mother was always faithful. And so dad made us as little boys always go to church. But then when we got older and got to be teenagers, we finally grew up and got cars, you know. Me and my older brother, I've got a brother a year older than me and he and I both had cars. And, uh, but, and so we, we were just normal boys and, uh, in some ways a little rowdy, you might say, but we grew up in church. So we had a fear of God and, uh, but you know, uh, uh 
dad, the way dad dealt with that was, is he would say, now, if you boys want to go, uh, if y'all want to go out or do whatever you want to do on Friday night, you know, on weekends, then you, you have to go to church. If, if you don't go to church on Sunday, you don't go anywhere the next weekend in your car. So we had to go to church. And uh, I'm so thankful for that today. But back then, you know, sometimes I wasn't so thankful about it. And uh, because I'd go to church and I'd get under conviction and wind up in the altar or, you know, God touching me and I'd make up my mind I'm going to do better and serve God in a better way. And then, you know, during the week I, 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 I wouldn't do so good. And then I'd hate to go back to church because I'd be convicted. But then I had to go back to church if I wanted to do anything else. So I'd go back to church. And so I lived in, uh, you almost might say, the torment of wrestling with the things of God and the things of this world uh, until God really got a hold of me. But um, but anyway, uh, I, I, getting back to how God draws people, uh, he, he was able to draw me because I was in church. I was where the Spirit of God was uh, working. Uh, my mother had me there. I saw her life had influence on me. I was where the Spirit of God was. I'm sure I felt the Spirit of God in my mother's womb when she was in church. And I think about that with mothers today that, you know, when they're expecting little babies and they get such a wonderful touch of the Holy Ghost in church and, and God touch them and those little children feeling that. And then when they're born and they come to church, you know, we got little children in our church now, but um, they don't all together understand or know what they're doing, but they've grown up around the spirit of God and they just mock mom and daddy and the other people in church and they, they lift their little hands and worship God and they feel God. They feel the spirit of God. And many of them get the Holy Ghost when they're just little, little children, just little bitty kids. And that, that you can't be any more blessed than that. You see, God has a way of dealing with those people. They, they're, they're part of his inheritance uh, part of his family. They're born into the family first, naturally with the Adamic nature, but it isn't very long that, that uh, God's able to draw them. God's able to deal with them. His spirits, they're able uh, to feel God and uh, God working in their life. And so th there's other children that's never been that blessed and they may have to get around someone that, you know, wasn't they weren't raised that way, and so but they may get around someone at school, a friend on the job, uh, maybe another family member, you know, and their life begins to touch them. That's how God draws people. God has a way of working through His saints, through His ministry, His church that reaches out and touches others, and God can draw people in that way. I tell people in our church, uh, uh, you know, I think when visitors comes in church, I think we ought to be friendly to them. If you want friends, the Bible says you must show yourself to be friendly. And so I think we ought to be, I think we ought to be friendly and charitable and love the people that come in our services and amongst us. And I think some of our saints are to go back and sit with them, greet them, and maybe sit with them where they don't feel estranged. But you can overdo it. You know, I tell people uh, in our church, I say, when the Spirit of God starts moving, hush. Leave those people alone. Don't be talking to them while the Spirit of God's working. When the Spirit of God starts moving in the church, be, be mindful that God may want to deal with them people and touch them by the Spirit. And if you keep interrupting them and dealing with them and talking to them because you don't know, you know, you're afraid of what they're gonna do while the Spirit's moving, turn that over to God. It's not your job to interrupt the Spirit of God. Back up, let God do a work. Let the Spirit of God work in those people's lives. Uh, you know, if you interrupt them and, 
and keep talking to them, then then God, you know, uh, God can't talk to them. They can't listen to two or three people at the same time. So uh, I tell the people in our church, be mindful of the Spirit of God. Be careful when the Spirit of God starts working. Don't interfere with it. Back up and be still. And uh, because there's where God can draw somebody by his Spirit, not only just by his Spirit, but it can be the Spirit in his people. It can be the Word of God that's in people. It can be their character that's been developed in the ways of God. So, uh, God uh, sent Jesus here to bring life. We're on this side of the new covenant. It took God 4,000 years to finally get the world ready from a fallen condition to receive Jesus Christ and, re and be born again. That's why he came here no one was born of God. Matter of fact, there's a scripture in John. Let's go to John, the third chapter. In John 3, <clears throat> where Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, um, and uh, the fifth verse, Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he can not enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the spirit. Now, it may surprise you a little bit of how I look at that scripture right there where he said, except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. A lot of people interpret that to be, be <clears throat> baptized in water. Number one, you're not born of the spirit being baptized in water. However, water baptism is essential. It's part of repentance, <clears throat> but... Uh, and what it is, is God wants you to confess. He wants you to humble yourself. Uh, being baptized in water, it, the word baptism means to bury. And that means for you to be, um, to when you come to God, when you finally surrender to God's wooing and, and asking you to come to him, and to give your life over to him. The first thing you do is repent. Now, the word repentance doesn't just mean to say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I have, have not turned my life over to you before now. Uh, I'm sorry that I haven't been able to walk, uh, you know, like, like I would have liked to, what, you know, whatever's kept you from it. But when God really gets a hold of you, you humble down and yield over to God and let God come into your life. Uh, first thing is repentance. And yes, repentance is, yes, Lord, I'm sorry. God, please forgive me. Forgive me for all my sins and my uh, wickedness. I was gonna say early about iniquity. Iniquity is your will to walk your own way. The 119th Psalm says that they, uh, they that fear him walk in his ways uh, and do no iniquity. That means those that don't fear him and don't walk in his ways walk their own way, which is iniquity. That's what iniquity is. It's when you do your own will, it's the Adamic nature and, you, and that's living in a sinful nature doing your own will. But <clears throat> uh, in repentance, you repent. God, forgive me for my iniquity, for my doing my own will and not recognize you and you as my character, um, or, uh, as my creator. And then the word repentance means to turn 
and go the other way. So if you're walking doing your own will, you're going to have to learn to turn and walk in God's way and, and do God's will. Now, let me, let me say this about God. God doesn't want you to do his will just so he can be boss. That, that's not God at all. He wants you to walk in his way because it's, it's righteousness. His way is understanding the difference between right and wrong. His way is he loves you and that's why he wants you to do right. It's like a mother and father training up their child to do what's right. God wants you to do what's right and he knows that's his way. That's his righteousness. He wants to help you in that. He wants to help you see the difference and know the difference. Paul said in the fifth chapter of Hebrews, he said that babes, you know, they, they have to have milk, they, milk of the word. Like a little baby, a little baby don't have any teeth. They can't eat meat. They can't chew meat. They can't digest anything but milk. But, and that's a picture. A newborn, again, Christian is, is to, first, they're just eat, drinking the milk of the word of God. They're just getting the, nat, the, 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 the sweet things about salvation, God's forgiveness, God's goodness to you, how much God loves you, uh, the explanation of how to get saved, to, like I'm talking about today, just in repentance and, and Holy Ghost baptism. Well, but, but then Paul says, he that's a full age eats strong meat. See, finally, you're to develop spiritual teeth where you can chew up. You can get into the word of God deeper than just the milk of the word you can get a greater understanding, the details. Some of the things of God is not easy to understand because it has to do with God's overall purpose. This is a big, big plan of God and it has lots of details to it. And to eat strong meat and Paul said to discern both good and evil. See, there's things people that are young in the Lord, just like a little child, that they're doing, they don't even know it's sin. They don't even know this. I'm just doing my will. They don't even understand it, that it's their will. But as you serve God and grow in him and develop more, get spiritual teeth, finally you get to where you can take the stronger understanding, things about your own character. What, what causes you to do the things you do? What, what, uh, what's your motive in life? What, what's caused you to have the attitude that you have? Those things, God can help you as you grow and develop. God will help you to develop in those areas. And so, uh, uh, to repentance means not only I'm sorry, Lord, but it means I'm gonna turn and go the other way. I've been doing my will, but now I'm gonna do your will. I'm gonna turn, I'm gonna follow you, I'm gonna learn of you, I'm gonna allow you to help me in my endeavor in life to find your purpose. I'm your creature. You created this. You created me. You had a purpose in it. I want to find that purpose. That's the only place there's true happiness. Like I said, Jesus, because he loved righteousness and hated iniquity. And do you realize you have to learn? Sorry, I can't do that on this app. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. That's my TV. It's something about Google hears me talking and then it tries to butt in, help me out here. Anyway, uh, uh, the, to, to love righteousness and to hate iniquity, you have, to, you have to learn something about righteousness. You have to learn why, why certain things are righteous. 
why certain things are not righteous. Sometimes the difference between right and wrong is, is, is splits a hair almost. You know, there's such a thing as you've heard of a white lie. There's no such thing as, as a white lie. It's either a lie and it's a black lie or it's not. Uh, you know, but but people, they're talking about a little lie, you know, a, a little bitty lie like when a little child, you know, you catch his hand in a candy jar and you say, did you, did I tell you not, I told you not to eat that. Did you eat one? They go, no. But you see cookie crumbs hanging out the corner. <laughs> well, you know, my son one time, bless his heart, he's, He's uh, he's fifty one years old now, so he's not he's not a boy. He's a he's a man. In fact, I was just thinking about him yesterday. I thought, oh God, he's getting old. <laughs> you know, I mean, fifty one years old isn't old, but it's not young either. He's not a young whippersnapper. You know, I know how quick twenty years goes by, and then he's going to be seventy one, and I don't want to see him get that old. I mean, I do. I want him to live. To, as long as is is God's grace will let him live, but you know my old body's getting more uh, stiff and dilapidated, and I'm trying. I'm riding. My, I'm riding my bike several times a week. I'm doing stretch exercises. I still my joints. I mean, I'm nowhere near like what I was when I was fifty, and sure not what I was when I was thirty or twenty. So anyway, I just felt for him because I know where he's headed. You know. Anyway, to get back to have a knowledge of righteousness and a knowledge of iniquity. See, there's some things, like I said, splits hair. Some, there, there's some things somebody will have to help you. God would even have to help you to see and discern evil where there's an evil motive. It may not look like evil, but when you find the motive of it, see, that, that, that can be the very difference between right and wrong is what the motive was. Anyway, uh, I, uh, uh, when God woos us, that water baptism I was talking about is to bury, when you come to God and you go in the water and you that whoever baptizes you, and puts you under the water. I make sure when I baptize people, they don't even have a little bitty finger sticking out because it means to bury, and it, the picture of it is to bury that old life of Adam, doing Adam's will, the Adamic nature, and coming up out of the water with the attitude and the confession. It, it ought to be a public confession, I think, even if it's just one or two that witnesses it. I think there ought to be a public confession that I have made a decision that I'm going to serve God. All of my carnal friends, all of my worldly friends, I want you to know I've made a decision to serve God. I can't go this way with y'all anymore. I've made a, I've made a profession, a commitment, and I'm going to serve God. That's necessary for you to have a, a starting place. Peter said, it's an answer to a good conscience towards God. That's when you made a conscious, you were conscious, you consciously made a decision and you, you professed it with an action of water repentance. And then you are to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, getting back here to Nicodemus where he said, for you to be born of water and spirit. Now, some people think that water is being born of, of being baptized. I don't see that. I believe that water there is talking about a natural birth. When, when, a, when a baby's born, he's housed in his mother's womb in water. Remember her water breaks. He's, he's in a, sack of water, and that protects that child. That water's a protection. Of course, he's getting oxygen and, and feeding his blood cells through his mother's uh, 
uh, what do you call that cord? Uh, anyway, somebody, <laughs> somebody have to put it up. When you get my age, it's just words like that escape from time to time. Uh, umbilical cord, there you go. Uh, nobody put it up, by the way. I thought of it on my own. <laughs> anyway, uh, but that baby's in water. Now you say, well, why do you see that that way? Because of the next spirit. You must be born of the spirit of, of uh, the, how does it say it? You must be born, uh, which is, uh, except a man be born of water and of the spirit. Verse five, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit, spirit. See, he reveals what he's talking about, born of water or the flesh, or born of the spirit, that which is born of the spirit, spirit. Then he goes on to say, you know, that you must be born again. And then he tells about the wind blowing and you don't know where it came from. You heard it. You knew the wind blew, but you don't, you know, you, you can't see it. You just know it happened. And that's what he's saying about somebody being born of the spirit. You, you can't see somebody being born of the spirit like you can see them being born in the natural. But you know, if you're the one that was born again, you know you've been born again. Praise God. So <clears throat> uh, it, it's a precious, wonderful thing to be born of God his spirit, to be born of his nature. And then for us to be born of his nature, now the process begins. See, Jesus, if you go back to, to Hebrews, the second chapter there, let's go back to it. <clears throat> By the way, I wasn't even gonna talk on this today, but I got started and this seemed like this is where I was led to talk, so I continued in it. And I feel the Lord in it. Possibly those that, that uh, there, Brother Michael, my son, put umbilical cord <laughs> down for me. All right, so um, back in the second chapter of Hebrews, uh, <clears throat> in the 18th verse, for it says, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he's able to secure them that are tempted. In other words, <clears throat> uh, let's go back up here to the 14th verse. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is the devil. Now, let me, let me just say this. Um, it wasn't just his death on the cross that accomplished that. It, if, you, if you link that scripture up with the 18th verse where it says, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he's able to secure them that are tempted. See, Jesus, because he took on the Adamic nature and he became a human, he was God's child. He was the only man since Adam that was ever on the earth before he got here or until he got here that had both the nature of God and, the, and, and, and that was a human, had a human nature, the Adamic nature, and had um, God's nature. And therefore, because he was a human, he was tempted. In fact, if you read on in Hebrews in the fourth chapter, it says he was tempted in all points as we are. And there is, by the way, no such thing as a templess temptation. Jesus was tempted. He wanted to do wrong. Let me let that soak in. You cannot be tempted unless you want to do something that you shouldn't do. You're tempted to do it. And evil. See, he, he, he became like, he took part the same of the same as we are 
to destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. The evil that's in this world, that's why death overshadowed. Death overshadowed evil. The power of death was overshadowing everyone because of their evil that worked in every man. It doesn't matter what you believe about the devil. The evil of the devil works in your mind and in your being when you behave. It's in your behavior. And so... Jesus came to destroy that. And the way he over destroyed it was is he overcame it. He died out. Listen to this scripture in Romans 8. It says, Paul said to mortify the deeds of the flesh through the spirit. So it takes the spirit of God to help you. Now, let me just say this to you. You are not going to be able to mortify the deeds of the flesh, not the only thing you're able to mortify when you're baptized is just to repent and make a profession and God forgives you for all your past sins because of the work of Christ, because of what Christ did. And because of the death that he died, being tempted and going through a process. Isaiah 53 says, it pleased God to bruise him. See, unless you understand how this works, you, you, you might have trouble with that. But God put Jesus through, he put, he put Jesus through a process to help him and cause him to mortify the deeds of the flesh through the spirit. And it pleased God to put him through those things. And it pleases God to put you through those things. And Jesus, having been tempted and went through See, he was the first roots. He was the first partaker. He was the first one that was able to overcome the Adamic nature and be perfected in the nature of his father. And he came so that you and I could have the same. And so here, he himself suffered being tempted. He's able to secure our help and draw and, and work with us to help us achieve what he was able to achieve. So you, if you go, now let's, let's turn to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. This is a, a, a cardinal scripture for those of us that uh, are holding to this message. But let me, let me just show you here in this scripture, you cannot deny it, that uh, here, here's where he gave, verse 11, Ephesians 4, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. This is where he developed a New Testament ministry for the perfecting of the saints, see, so that the saints of God could be perfected in this nature the nature of God that they've been born of. For the work of the ministry, that's why he called them, for the edifying of the body of Christ, or that word edifying means the, the building up of, till we all come in the unity of the faith. See, there's not to be all these different faiths and different beliefs about Jesus Christ, but there's just one truth. There's just one true understanding of the word of God and God's purpose in his plan. Until, verse 13, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. See, so we're all to grow to that place, to the fullness of the stature. Now, that doesn't mean that we'd all have the same position as Christ. He's the head of the body. He's the son of God, uh, you know, that came down from heaven. He has a position of being the head over what God has done. 
but we all have a position somewhere in the kingdom of heaven. And the glory of it all is, is we're all to inherit eternal life. But we all need to go through this process of developing and growing in God and maturing and finishing the work in the nature. Finally, if you've mortified the deeds of the flesh, eventually the Adamic nature ceases to exist. You quit feeding that nature. You quit you know, letting that nature have any influence over you. And eventually, you, look, it's your mind. It's your mindset. Uh, if, you, if you know the ways of man, you're going to do the things that man does. If you're carnal, you, you'll have carnal ways. But as you learn the ways of God, Paul mentions to the Galatians, he says, he tells them, to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Well, let me just tell you something. That's not talking about, you know, having some spiritual connection with God where it's, you know, I'm getting a, I'm getting a signal from, no, it's growing and developing and learning, gaining a spiritual understanding and having the spirit of God work in your life. Yes, the spirit can talk to you, but you won't be able to know if it's my spirit. I mean, sometimes I've had, I've had things happen to me and I thought, now is this God talking or is it the devil? <laughs> I know that may sound strange, but you don't always know until you grow and develop where you have some understanding of the things of God and your mind becomes a spiritual mind. Then you're led by the, that spiritual understanding. And the Spirit of God will bear witness with it. But if you don't have an understanding, the Spirit doesn't have anything to bear witness with. So it's a process. You have to go through a process of developing. You say, well, Brother Smith, what happens if I die before I get through the process? Resurrection. There is a just resurrection. Resurrection of the just and there's a resurrection of the unjust. Don't live the life and continue living the life of an unjust person. The word just, it's very synonymous with faithful, holy, a saint, wise. That, those uh, upright, uh, you know, but it takes God to help us with that. It's going to take God. You got to get in this process and walk with God. We're, we're, we're running a race, but we haven't finished it yet. I want to get to the place and let me encourage you to set your hopes and your sight on the high calling. Paul mentioned in third chapter of Philippians. Set your sights on that. That I, I'm going to live a life of a just person. And I'm going to serve God until he finishes his work in me. Now, you don't know, neither do I know. Every step we need to take, God knows what it's going to take for you to finish the work that he's called you to do. To develop his righteousness in your life. And so God, uh, he will continue to work if you'll focus and continue to serve him. He's the one. He knows and he knows how to lead you. Jesus, he's able to secure, to help you and help you develop in the things of God and just be assured of this that if something happened to me before I finished, look what Paul said. He told it to, he wrote it in his letter to Timothy. He said, I have finished my course. I fought a good fight and I finished. There is therefore a crown of righteousness laid up for me, a crown to be crowned, to finally finish this work of righteousness 
And not for me only, he said, but for them also who love his appearing. That don't mean for people that who's just waiting and developing a love for Jesus to come back naturally and catch him away in what the world calls a rapture. But it, it's his appearing in your life for you to become liking the fullness of the stature of the man Christ Jesus. You can't do it. It's impossible with man. But what's impossible with man is possible with God. He's able. He's more than able to do more above what you can ask or think. Well, he's able to do more than even asking or thinking of him making us righteous. We really don't understand it until we grow in it, as we develop in it. That's why the more righteousness of God you learn, the more you're going to love it. Love righteousness. I said the other day, and I'll try to close with this, that perfect love cast out fear. And that is understanding the perfect love of God. And it takes growing in your walk and relationship with him. The more you understand him, the less fear you're going to have. It'll cast it out. Because you get close enough to God that you'll begin to trust him more and more. To where you understand his perfect love in such a way. And by the way, as you grow and develop in this relationship with him, you will develop a perfect love. And people who you're around will understand. They'll see your love and they'll have more and more confidence in you as you lead them in the ways of Christ as an example. My Lord, saints of God, we've got a great calling. A great calling. Well, right now, we, uh, we're still waiting on this coronavirus to, to pass. God knows exactly where we are. And um, I've, I've, I've thought about this. It may cause us to utilize more um, the, the social media. There is, by the way, let me say this. There is an order to God's ministry. Firstly, apostles. Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. Then there's uh, pastors and evangelists. So <clears throat> there's an order. So God, God's not, he's not interested in just every man, you know, doing a, an individual, his own will in the ministry. But there's an order. There's an order that God's going to develop among us that's, that's greater even than we have today. Let's keep serving him. Let's trust him. I'm convinced he loves us, and I'm convinced that his people, he'll get us through this. There's a great deal yet to do. I mentioned I talked to some on that Thursday night. I was kind of using the weeknight services, a little bit more in-depth teaching, talking about the end time, where we're at in God's time, things that has to transpire yet. One of the things I'm, I may work on this Thursday night, I mentioned I will talk again Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Probably may talk, unless the Lord deals differently, I may talk on, um, thank you for the way, Brother Boyd. Um, anyway, uh, I may talk some more on the image of the beast. A lot of people don't understand the beast system a lot of people don't understand there's a beast system in existence right now. Now, it's not in its dragon power, but there is a dragon head coming, a two-horned beast, and that dragon head is going to make the image of the beast. And it will eventually turn its power, give, give the image of the beast, or the, give the beast its power. So the Bible talks about 
that this hadn't took place yet, but it's going to take place in the end of our world before God finishes this work and makes up his bride. There will be an image to the beast made. There will be another dragon. There's going to be a dragon. There's going to be two dragon heads come before the 10 kings even take over. I'm going to talk about that. Maybe some more to Thursday night at 7 p.m. If, if the Lord wills and doesn't direct it in another direction. Anyway, thank you for listening today. God bless you. I miss having church, I'm telling you. I, I'm in I'm some way enjoying these talks, but and I may keep them up. Even after we get back together. But I need the saints of God. I need to feel you. I need to see you. Hold steady. Let's all, what's that first service going to be like? What's it going to be like when we come back together in that? The first service after the, the social uh, distancing, or whatever it is they're calling, separation or whatever. But when we come back together in that first service, oh, it's going to feel good. Then to have the Spirit of God come down among us and bless us. I'm looking forward to it. I want to end by saying thank you, saints of First Gospel Church. Many of you have mailed your tithes in. Our, our post office boxes. Um, see if I can remember what it is. Is it 49414? We've changed. Let me let me get it for you if you're still if you're looking, you know, if you're wondering what it is. Um, there it is. Four six four one four, post office box four six four one four, Little Rock seven two two zero four is the zip code. So God bless you. Uh, I want to thank you for supporting the church in its finances right now during this time. Our uh, our 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 church expenses go on. It's still costing money to to operate the church. So. Uh, all the bills still keep coming in and we still have to pay them. So thank you again for mailing in your tithes and your offerings. And uh, we want you to know we're praying for you. Uh, keep praying for those that you have knowledge of that are in need. Uh, uh, in our, our local assembly, uh, Brother Daniels needs your prayers. Sister Abraham, Sister Alexander, Sister... Uh, uh, Wilson, Sister Crafton, she's always suffering with her diabetic situation. Brother Shelby uh, Weaver, Brother Ray and Sister Susan, we Susan Weaver. There's so many that uh, have needs. Please keep them in your prayers. Thank you for praying for me. I'm improving on this episode that I recently had with vertigo. I still am suffering with it, but I am better and I am improving. I'm trusting God to help me get over it completely. God bless you all. I'm praying for you. Have a good day. In Jesus' name, we pray that he'll bless you. Till I see you again, God bless.